Let's talk a little bit more about the mechanics of pooling. So you have a small tract and you need to pool, how do you do it? First, I think it's important uh, to look at Texas, the Texas Mineral Interest Pooling Act. So Texas does have an act that allows pooling even when one of the owners of the well doesn't want it. But as we'll see, it, you really have to go to some work to do this, you know, forced pooling, pooling against a, an owner's will. For one thing, it applies only to fields that were discovered after 1961. So sort of after Texas abandoned this living allowables approach to just letting everybody have their own well and produce more from it so they could pay for a well. So there's no forced pooling in those old fields. And we know that sometimes those old fields are still producing today. But uh, if you have a new field, yes, you can use the Texas Mineral Interest Pooling Act. Now, you have to exhaust efforts to pool voluntarily. So that means you have to do your best to negotiate with everybody uh, to, to pool before you go to the Railroad Commission to ask them to force pool you. Uh, but you also have to make sure that it, the Railroad Commission thinks that the efforts you made to voluntarily pool included fair and reasonable offers to the other people before you start going and asking the Railroad Commission to force them to share a well with you. So basically, the parties, if the parties can't work it out, the state ultimately will, but it's as a last resort. And we'll see that it can be quite difficult in some cases. So why would you want to pool? Well, there's lots of reasons. So one is, you know, just geologic efficiency. That's the best way to produce some reservoirs. So it may, you know, you may think, oh shoot, we all need to drill our own wells to make sure we get our own oil and gas, but it may make more sense. You may get more oil ultimately out of the reservoir, to come together and produce it with just the wells that are necessary. There's also obviously business efficiency. So maybe it just doesn't make sense to build that many wells, to drill that many wells. Each of them costs more money. So it's more efficient to just drill some. Also, it may be necessary to comply with spacing rules. So you know, as we said, some places say, look, you have to have 40 acres together or 60 acres together or, or 160 acres together to drill a well, and maybe you only have 10 acres. So you're gonna have to combine forces with a bunch of other property owners to have enough to drill a well. So how can you pool? Well, I can have everybody agree. And so, you know, that means the landowners agree, the oil companies operating agree, that's quite possible. In practice, the way things usually happen is that every lease, remember, most landowners aren't gonna produce the oil and gas themselves, they don't have the capital or the expertise to produce that oil and gas. So they have a lease with an oil and gas company to produce their oil and gas. Now that company will usually in that lease receive the power to pool that land if necessary. And so that company will have a delegated authority to pool its land and it may want to do so to uh, more efficiently develop the reservoir and it may have to do so to have enough land to put into a drilling unit. You can also, this is a little bit rarer, but common in sort of urban subdivisions or suburban subdivisions is a community lease. And that's where a whole bunch of neighbors come together and sign a lease with an oil company to develop their property. Normally, you would just sort of separately lease. We'll have lots of cases about that during the course of the semester. But if there's like 40 properties, it may make sense for you just all to sign a lease with one oil company to, to develop your property. Finally, there's compulsory. So the state can come in and force you to pool. And we'll talk about some of the circumstances for that today. So as a primary example, we're gonna talk about this Carson versus Railroad Commission case, page 773. So what happened is that BTA offered Carson to apportion royalty among the royalty uh, owners on an acreage basis. And really what had happened is that uh, Carson owned uh, a third of the property that BTA wanted to put in this well. 
So let's say, you know, Carson owned 20 acres and then there's 40 acres over here. Now, that seems like a pretty fair offer. BTA says, you know what? You've got a third of the property for the 60 acres we need for this well. And so you're gonna get a third of the production. So why doesn't Carson accept this? Well, the problem here is that BTA didn't do this before they drilled, they did it after they drilled. And they had already drilled a well on Carson's property and it was already producing oil. So Carson says, wait, 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 wait. Right now, the entire landowner share is for me. Usually that's a one eighth royalty. So I'm getting that entire one eighth royalty. Now, if I have to share with my neighbors, all of a sudden I just get a one third of that one eighth, just one twenty fourth, one third of that one eighth. So that doesn't seem fair. But imagine the perspective of BTA. They say, well, wait a second, there's these owners of these other 40 acres. If they go to the railroad commission and ask to drill a well, what's the railroad commission gonna tell them? They're gonna say, sorry, you don't have enough land. There's already a well right there. So we have to give them some oil. How are we gonna give them the oil unless they share in that well? And if they're sharing in that well, the whole way we're supposed to share is by acreage. So when Carson, when Carson rejected this order, BTA goes to the Railroad Commission and says, look, we offered to share on an acreage basis. We made a fair and reasonable offer and they rejected it. So under the Mineral Interest Pooling Act, Texas's act, this is a new field, so we should be able to use it. We want you to force pool them and so they can share with the neighbors and then everybody gets a share of this oil and gas. So was that offer fair and reasonable? Well, ultimately, the Texas Supreme Court says no. And the reason they say no is they say, well, wait a second, this would have been reasonable if you had offered to share on an acreage basis before they drill. But now that you're already producing oil on Carson's property, why should they agree to this? So we're not saying how much of an extra you need to give them because the oil well is on their property, but you're gonna have to give them something extra. And what I'll tell you about these fair and reasonable cases is, is the offer fair and reasonable so that you can do force pooling? There's no really clear answers. So uh, how would you try to ensure that your offer was fair and reasonable? Well, I think at a minimum, you're gonna have to give people at least the share of the well that their acreage would be uh, would amount to. But BTA did that here, and the Supreme Court said it's still not reasonable. So I think you also have to consider if they have some advantage, as here Carson did, because the oil well was on his land. So that fairness, what the Supreme Court here says, is from the standpoint of the offeree at the time of the offer. So even if this would have been reasonable before they drilled, it's not reasonable after they found oil and gas by drilling on Carson's land. And there has to be serious good faith negotiation by both parties and clearly Supreme Court didn't think this measured up. I think you can see this is a good example, we'll see many throughout the book, of where small track owners are kind of, tend to be favored in the courts, uh, particularly the Supreme Court, uh, and particularly in some of these older cases. Now, when you have this compulsory pooling, usually if you're forced pooled in against your will, you're gonna get at least an acreage basis. But this Carson case shows that sometimes you can get even more, especially if the Railroad Commission believes that's equitable as described as on page 779. But at least at a minimum, most non-consenting owners share are gonna be able to get uh, at least an acreage basis, if not more. Okay, so one other thing the Supreme Court says here, and I think it's important to understand, is that the initial idea of the Mineral Interest Pooling Act was kind of for a muscle in. And what a muscle in is like, imagine a lot of people around a buffet table and you muscle your way in. So it's a situation where 
there is a small landowner that is not able to drill his or her, her own well because he or she doesn't have enough property. And so they want to get a share of production from an existing well. So if you own a small tract and you don't receive a fair offer to pool voluntarily, you can muscle into a unit. That means you force your way into the unit and it can be even after they have a producing well. Um, and the terms, you know, what makes terms unfair or unreasonable? As I said, very hard to say. There are some suggestions in page 778. There are some, you know, accounting things that the oil company could do that were unfair. But basically, you have to make a reasonable offer. And what a reasonable offer is, is something that there's a lot of negotiation about on the ground, and there's a lot of litigation about afterwards. I think the other thing that you should think about is who wants pool. So in conventional reservoirs, typically somebody who is not involved in drilling wants pooling because they are concerned that if they don't, they can't drill their own wealth, they don't have enough land, but if they don't pool into a unit, all the oil and gas under their property will be produced away, will be sucked away from underneath their land. Nowadays, it's a little bit different because remember with fracking, you have these long horizontal laterals. You can't drill underneath somebody's land if you don't have the right to produce oil and gas on their land. So you can't drill under these small owner's properties unless they give you consent. And so that changes things because now it's the people who are drilling who want, who want to force pool those smaller landowners, right? Previously, they could say, yeah, I'm drilling. You know, if you wanna agree to my good offer, fine, or you can go to the railroad commission and try to force pool me. Nowadays, they can't drill under their land, so they're having to say, hey, look, agree to me, otherwise I'm gonna go to the railroad commission and try and force pool you because I need to drill under your property. Now in other states, there's much broader ability to pool. That's described on page 782 in your book. Most states allow the conservation agency to pool tracks even if owners don't want to. And so, you can, uh, it's kind of like zoning, right? So that it can be the, the conservation agency can do this whenever they want to. There's also no small tract exception. So this whole Texas business, of even if you have a one acre property, you get a well and you should have living allowables is not the case in other states. So typically any owner in a drilling unit can demand pooling. So anybody can initiate a request to the conservation agency now, what happens if you are pooled? Okay, this can be complicated because the normal relationship between a landowner and an oil and gas company is that the landowner leases his or her land to the oil and gas company. And so it's controlled by a lease. But if the landowner is pooled in without having ever signed a lease, that means there's a relationship with that oil and gas company that is um, solely through pooling, solely forced by the railroad commission. So how does that work? Well, uh, one of the most common uh, ways that it's handled is with either the landowner paying costs, that can be really expensive, a well can be a million dollars or more, right? Or can be carried, so what that means is Carried means somebody else is paying your costs. So that means that the oil companies that have leased the land on the other landowner's property, they pay your costs. And then when oil comes out of the well, they get to keep all that money until their costs are paid back. And then they start paying you money once the costs are paid off. Or as an alternative, you could just lease to the parties that are actually, uh, that are actually operating. So when you get force pooled in, or when you muscle in to a, to a well, 
you can just have a lease basically with an oil and gas operating party. So you would have something that's like basically like the normal relationship between a landowner and an oil and gas company. So we'll talk about those two ways of doing things. Okay, so let's just give you an example of how this can get quite complicated. And you have to figure out you know, who's paying the costs up front, who gets the oil and gas. Remember that we're always sharing things on an acreage basis, at least normally, unless there's something unusual like we had in that Carson case. So look at, let's imagine that uh, this, we're in a state where you need all 160 acres here. So this is a 160 acre unit. You need that whole thing. And let's imagine that A, B, and D are leased to Iomi Oil, okay? So you got 100 of those 160 acres that are all leased. C is leased to Blackmore Gas. So 40 acres leased to somebody else. And then E and F are unleased. So they haven't leased to anybody. Okay, so what can Iomi Oil do here? They control most of this unit. They control 100 acres. But let's say we're in a state where they need 160 acres to lease. So what can they do? Well, clearly they could potentially lease with E and F. That'd be great because then they would own 120 acres. So they'd be quite close. They can enter into a farm out with Blackmore Gas. A farm out, if you take oil and gas contracts, which is an advanced oil and gas course with Professor Lowe, you'll learn all about that. But basically, you know, does that, they could take over uh, they could take over Blackmore Gas's lease. Similarly, they could take a top lease from C. We'll talk about what that means in the future, but it basically means that if Blackmore Gas's lease goes away, they're gonna have the lease, or they could enter into a joint operating agreement. Again, we won't talk about joint operating agreements. That's for an advanced course. But basically that says, we're gonna all operate this together, share costs and share revenues. It's like kind of like a partnership, although a little bit uh, customized, but they could enter into that joint operating agreement with the parties that they don't have the lease. So E, F, and C. So those are their options. Okay, so what, uh, and this is similar to those exa that examples, you have two examples on 802 and 803 in your book. Okay. So in most states, if those negotiations fail to give EOMI control over this whole 160 acres, they could also go and seek forced pooling from the State Conservation Commission. Now, the State Conservation Commission can decide, you know, this pool should be developed and it's gonna name one party to operate it. Uh, and that's usually gonna be the majority owner. Here, EOMI Oil owns 100 acres, so that would be EOMI Oil. Now, the other, owners that are not chosen. So C, right, Blackmore Gas and E and F, they've got the choice, they can participate. And what participate in this case means is you pay the cost for the well that Eomi Oil is gonna drill and you receive the revenue from it, just like Eomi Oil. They can be carried with a penalty, that's their second option. So carried with a penalty means Eomi Oil will pay your cost. You don't have to pay us anything. But when oil starts coming back from that, Eomi oil is gonna get paid back first. And it's gonna be with a penalty. So Eomi oil gets paid back, not just their cost, but some more. And we'll see an example of that and how that works. Um, and the reason for that is what happens if there's no oil, which is a very real possibility. Well then, Eomi oil has paid for all of this but it doesn't get anything back because the other parties just let them pay for it. So the normal rule is that if you paid for it and you paid somebody else's costs, you are gonna be able to recover not just your costs, but also a penalty before you start paying back those other parties. And the third option that those parties would have, if they were force pooled, is they could lease and they could just say, okay, well, we'll just lease to you Eomi oil. So then what share of the production on their acreage would they get? Well, you know, probably one eighth, right? They would get that landowner royalty you know, plus a bonus. They would get that normal lease and we'll spend a lot of time 
talking about leases in this course. So participate, that means every interest owner pays its share. So if you own 40 acres of the 160, you're gonna pay for a quarter of the well. If you own 10 acres of the 160, you'll pay a 16th of the well. Typically you pay in advance and then you get a percent, a similar percentage of the revenue, right? If you have 40 acres of 160 acres, you're gonna get a quarter of the revenue. So in that case, Yomi Oil, because it has leased 100 of the 160 acres, would pay 100 of 160th of the cost. Blackmore would pay 40 of 160th because it just had a quarter. E has just five acres of the 160 acres and F has just 15 acres. So they would each pay their share. The other idea would be to be carried. So remember, carried means somebody else pays your costs. So E and F say, we don't have the cash up front as most landowners don't. And so Iomi and Blackmore go ahead, the two oil companies and drill, they pool their resources. E and F won't have to pay if they don't find, if Blackmore and Iomi don't find anything. But if the state has like a 300% penalty, which is quite common, then Iomi and Blackmore will get to get 300% of all their costs back before ENF get anything. So there's that penalty when you're carried that compensates the person that actually puts the money up front to take the risk of drilling the well. So let's look at an example of a penalty case. This is this Benyon versus a &R production case from Utah, 1991. It's on page 784 of your book. So Benyon's land was spaced by Utah. The state ordered a well drilled, but it wasn't on Benyon's land. So no, uh, nothing on Benyon's land, but he's pooled into that. He's treated as an unleased owner for that first well. And he actually gets kind of a sweet deal. So he doesn't have to put any of the risk of paying for this you know, multiple hundreds of thousands of dollars for million dollar well, he doesn't pay, uh, he doesn't have to pay a penalty. So as soon as that well gets enough oil and gas to pay back its cost, he starts getting money. So that's a pretty good deal. Now with the second well, the state says, okay, wait, 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 wait. We're gonna allow the drilling parties to recur require their equipment costs beyond the well, and we're gonna require uh, allow them to cover 175% of the cost of completing uh, and equipping and drilling the well. So they're getting a penalty. It's not a huge penalty. It's not a 300% penalty. It's just 175%. But Benyon says, no, 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 wait a second. Uh, I, you can't get a penalty from me. Why are you charging me just because I didn't want to put the capital up front? And the court says, no, 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 this is not you know, a constitutional problem, it's not a statutory problem, this just makes sense. The parties that put all the capital on the line, that put their money on the line and take the entire risk that there could be no oil and gas there at all, they are allowed to recover a penalty before they start paying you back. Now, I'm gonna give you another example, which is Oklahoma style force pooling, which often force, forces that uh, pooled owner into something more like a lease, which is actually a little bit simpler because that's the more normal relationship between an oil and gas company and a landowner. So this is Anderson versus the Oklahoma Corporation Commission. It's from Oklahoma in 1957. It's on page 798. So in this case, you had 80 acre spacing unit, which pools the interest of all these owners. Anderson says, no, I'm not gonna pay up front for drilling, right? I'm not gonna uh, participate by paying my costs for drilling the well. And the agency says, you know what, fine, don't. You will just treat you like a landowner. A landowner, normally if they lease their land, they don't pay any money up front either. They just get a bonus for when the lease is signed and then they get a royalty, a share of production, usually one eighth. And so the, uh, that's what the Corporation Commission allows here. And so that's what happened. That's kind of Oklahoma style force pooling, which is to say when you're force pooled, you get 
basically a normal, a normal lease. And so you have what looks like a basic leasing relationship with that oil and gas company. And we'll talk about uh, leases for uh, several weeks of this course.